theater. Uh, so to get to our conference to start the first session, the economy, there's a lot of uncertainties in our economy. We have the sequester occurring, uh, most likely. We have another debt limit that will be coming up in the spring. We have a budget continuing resolution that we're facing the Congress to decide. And you know, how are all these things going to affect the economy and, and spending? And um, on the employer sector, with, uh, they have a lot of decisions employers have to face with health benefits and their employees, what to do with the employees, whether to sign them up for the exchanges or continue their health, health insurance. And then we have the issue of the, the federal debt and the growing deficit, that the fastest growing aspect of it is the entitlements part. And uh, uh, you know, what's that going to do with spending, particularly with Medicare and increased Medicaid expansion? So we're very fortunate today to have <clears throat> three experts in each of these areas, in the economy and the employer sector and the federal budget. And so uh, I'd like to start by introducing uh, on the economy, Jim Glassman. Uh, Jim is uh, the managing, uh, managing director for J.P. Morgan Chase and a head economist for Chase Commercial Banking. Uh, he provides market insights to help clients better understand the changing economy and its impact on their business. Uh, he publishes a great deal of independent research on the economy. He's uh, cited often in the financial media. And uh, before he came to uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, he uh, worked for the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, D.C., and uh, he received his Ph.D. Uh, from Northwestern. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jim Glassman. Morning. You look pretty good. Not a day older. Uh, you'll notice, uh, by the way, um, there's an orphan uh, quote in the title. I was going to take it off, but I, one of my panelists is a compulsive editor, and I thought it would be kind of annoying to him to have to deal with that. So this is what happens when you grow up in boarding schools. <clears throat> um, disclaimer, um, my views don't necessarily represent the views of my company. And just to make sure I'm covered, they may not even represent my views. <laughs> <clears throat> the, uh, oh, Andy, but you know, by the way, um, I love the idea of uh, longevity. I mean, uh, of course, to me, when I hear you say we might be able to live longer, what that says to me is I may have to work longer. But, you know, but the truth is, I really think longevity is uh, really what has contributed to, it is an issue that we economists would have to deal with because the more time we have to unlock the creativity that's in our brains, I, I just think to myself, what would life be like if Mozart had lived more years or Beethoven lived more years? Unbelievable. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, we, um, in my mind, the national debate we're having about the economy suffers a bit from collective amnesia, um, thinking about the lessons of history. And I'm thinking of things like, for example, we hear when people complain that the Chinese are manipulating currencies, um, taking advantage of us, it makes me realize we sort of forget we've done this before. If you remember the Bretton Woods system after World War II, was designed in part to help Germany and Japan get back on their feet. So we've seen this story play before. And if a country, a sleeping giant that's impoverished, wants to get back on its feet, and they need to have a stable currency to make this happen, uh, we are all benefiting by this process, by the way, because it means that the global economy around us is, uh, there's some miraculous things going on. And you'll see that echoed in some of the pictures that I'm going to show you. Um, the complaints about pollution in Beijing and China, and the people say that 25% of the pollution in LA, by the way, comes from Beijing. Um, I remember, uh, I remember, I think we forget. Uh, I remember I spent, I went to first grade in Pasadena, and I didn't know there were mountains back behind <laughs> Pasadena. And, and, and it says something I hold in. The air was thick in LA, and I think we forget that People first worry about feeding their kids, and then when their living standard rises to a level that they can have the luxury of, of thinking about environmental issues, that's when it happens. And it wasn't really until the reason we've got really nice, uh, the air is much cleaner in LA now, is because it took a while for us. Our living standards had to rise to a level 
before people would embrace the Clean Air Act in 1970. So we're no different than anybody else and raise the living standard in much of the world and you'll see people more and more embrace um, environmental issues. The, uh, the panic about the Fed, I find really bizarre. The, the, the panic about the Fed and what they're doing has echoes of the Weimar Republic and the hyperinflation from the Weimar Republic. There's another history that Milton Friedman drew our attention to that matters more to me. Um, the, the history of the 1930s when the Fed in what it was doing saw, you know, excess reserves were rising and the Fed misinterpreted that thinking there was an inflation problem building. And the truth is you'll see a picture that I'm showing. I really think the, the perception about what the Fed is doing is completely wrong. What they're doing has nothing to do with what we learned about in school. This is a completely different phenomenon. It's not an inflation story because what we're never told, what you're not, you're not told in school when the Fed creates the reserves, the way it gets into money and in inflation, it's a partnership with the banking system. The reserves have to be loaned. Uh, I, I really think if the late Milton Friedman were alive today, uh, this story would not be so confusing to people. Um, the discussion about the deficit is really um, bizarre to me because, you know, we economists know there are cyclical deficits and structural deficits and deficits that are caused by the economy stumbling. Um, if you try to fix a cyclical deficit, you make things worse for the economy, which makes it worse for the deficit. So our focus needs to be not so much on the deficit that you see, it's the deficit that's in his mind's eye, Jim. The deficit that we all see out into the future as entitlement spending grows. Um, because that will become, today's cyclical deficit will go away when the economy gets back on its feet, but the structural deficit is really what the issue is about. Finally, the panic yes, last year, the worry that the European Union was going to blow apart uh, really panicked the market for a while. Um, yes, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to people to make everybody to, to, to design a central bank that has one interest rate, one currency, for a region so dispersed, but I really think that it's not as much about economics as it is about politics. I think you need to respect the scars of history that saw 100 million people die as a result of wars from the time of Bismarck to World War II that is really behind the scenes driving what's going on here. So when people said to me, oh, the European Union is gonna blow apart, it really didn't make sense to me because I think if you think to yourself, no, it's really, it's really driven by a history of it's trying to bring the region together and there are a lot of benefits in economic integration. So I think if we pay a little more attention to history, we, uh, we might actually see some important lessons there. Um, now, you don't have to know what's, uh, what I'm showing you here on this picture is global trends around the world. Uh, GDP growth, China, India, um, Japan, Europe, and the US and the solid areas of the global economy, we kind of slowed a little last year. Um, it generated a little bit of anxiety. It wasn't really in the US. The US, we kind of chugged along at a relatively steady pace, but the truth is what happened was really largely a result of the existential crisis in Europe. Europe stalled uh, because everybody, because of the panic, wondering whether this thing is gonna hold together, a lot of countries, Spain, Italy, were forced to take measures to try to address budget deficits, exactly what you shouldn't be doing, and it stalled the region. It slowed everybody else, the global economy. Most of that's behind us because, as you can tell now, the crisis in Europe is really fading, and it helped a lot on July 29 when the European Central Banker, when the head of a central bank says, we will do what it takes to preserve the monetary union, and believe me, we have the tools. That was the moment, the epiphany for the market. They realized Central banks, you know, they had the ability to step in here and buy time for politicians to finish the project that began a while ago. So a lot of what happened last year, the slowdown that you sort of see echoed in this picture, is mostly the result of what was going on in Europe, and it's largely over. We expect Europe to start to pick up again. So personally, I think the, the impact that that had on the developing world was kind of a blessing because the, the developing world was growing very rapidly, too rapidly. It was creating inflation problems. Their central banks were unwilling to do things to try to slow it down. And so if this picture, this picture which shows my forecast is correct, we will feel a whole lot better about how 2013 shapes up. Now, uh, on, on the US, there's a little bit of a different view 
uh, about the very near term. What I'm showing you on this picture is uh, GDP growth. The, band, the shaded band is the, the range of Fed forecasts. The CBO's forecast is the line here. I, I like them because they are showing you sort of a consensus of where I think a lot of my peers are in Wall Street. And I'm more on the optimistic side, sorry. Hate to be different. Um, the, the yellow line. Um, the, the real issue right now is most people think that 2013 is going to be very much like the last couple of years, kind of slow. And the main reason, the only reason, frankly, is because we don't know how to handicap what's going to happen 10 days from now, the sequestration. So you, if you take it, if you think that there's no way that these two sides are going to get together and we're going to have this automatic spending cuts across the board, makes no sense. Uh, you know, just target, you know, no, no targeted cuts, just everything across the board. It's going to, it's going to do a bit of a, it's going to slow things down a bit. And you're going to hear, you're seeing it already in the headlines. If you don't think that's going to happen, then uh, we're going to, you know, we get over that hurdle. And I think 2013 is going to be better than it's been. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And the only thing I'll say about the sequestration, and I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. I will tell you, everybody was sure we were going over a fiscal cliff in December. I don't know how it happened, but frankly, I think what happened was beyond what anybody was expecting. I think what the, that the, the tax agreement did what George Bush could not do, make permanent the 2001-2003 tax cuts. It took the tax issue off the table, which then focuses the debate on spending. My feeling all along was, look, we've got a, I don't really think what's going on in Washington is dysfunctional. It's democracy. We disagree. We have a right to disagree, and there's a process we have to go through. I'd rather live here, frankly, than in a place where seven men make the decision about what's going to happen. And I think what we're learning about our system, though, is as much as we disagree, the one thing we all agree on is the economy is the number one issue. And so what we saw play out in December, to me, tells you that at the end of the day, in the final hour, we will find a way around. And that's what I'm assuming about what's going to happen here. So um, I'm going to assume that the sequestration does not do damage, that does not happen in a way, we find a way to either soften it or we find a way of replacing this blanket cuts with something more creative and more interesting and more focused on the real problem. Now, uh, on the U.S. economy, here's, here's, the, here's the reason why I'm having a hard time not being structurally optimistic. Um, my feeling always was, if you're trying to figure out what's going on in the economy, we really, we economists have to focus most on what's going on in the business community. I mean, consumers are a big part of our economy, 70% of our economy, but frankly, uh, we're on automatic pilot. You pay us, we spend, you stop laying us off, we'll spend more. Consumers don't cause recessions. This is why we call these cycles business cycles. They're all about business sector. We have shareholders, family-run businesses. We can't make mistakes. When we do, we're out of business. Uh, we live by mark-to-market rules. We invest in projects that produce revenue far into the future. So when we get nervous about something and cut back, that's what triggers uh, dynamic cycles. That's why we have concepts like accelerator phenomenon, inventory cycles. So I always knew as an economist when I was way back in school that what you want to do if you're trying to figure out what's going on in the economy, focus on the financial health of the business community. And I tell you, it's unbelievable. This is, this, this is what this picture is showing you after-tax profits of American businesses as a percent of GDP. Um, what you'll show, by the, by the way, what's been happening since 1980s, none of us were taught this. We were taught that in modern developed economies, the distribution of income to the different factors of production is relatively stable. It goes back and forth to, in cycles, but we've not, we were not really prepared for a story that's unfolding here. But what's important about this picture is you'll notice that before we fall into recessions, which is the vertical bars, the margins are usually getting squeezed. That's a red flag that we're too optimistic, something's going on, businesses are getting squeezed, they've got to do things. So for one, one message from this picture is that, yes, we all got hammered in the 2008 recession, but the business community hunkered down, went in survival mode, restored their financial health more successfully than anybody really imagined in my community. And here we are, profit margins have recovered, and we're at all-time record highs. And what that tells me is, as an economist, I don't care what you say. I don't care how much uncertainty there is. What I know is that the world, you've never seen better. The, the, situ the setup has never been better because, and what it means to me is that when you're, making, when you're earning record margins, you have a powerful incentive to look forward. 
to think about expanding, to start thinking about your staffing needs. And that's why when you look at what businesses are doing, capital spending, again, is growing at a pretty decent pace. We go through these moments. But capital spending doing well, which is a good sign of what people think about the future. And more importantly to me, the job market for people who graduated from college 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, they've got squeezed badly. Because when businesses go in survival mode, it, they're not really encouraged to be hiring people who don't have skills and experience. And, and this was a really unique phenomenon in this recession, is that the younger you are, the fewer of you have a job relative to what happened where you were back in 2007. It's because skills and experience matter. The world has changed dramatically. It didn't used to be that way. When we used to have recessions, the old guys got pushed out, the young guys got pulled in. And, but what's happening now is young people, 25 to 35, are finding that on the margin, the job market is opening up the most for them. So we're starting to see a reversal of things that were going on during the recession. And that's all a sign that we know in the business community that things have changed. And we've got to think forward. And, and that's why this is happening. Second, the second message from this picture is, to me, um, powerful. And I don't think we got our hands around it. You get the impression the pendulum has been swinging since the 1980s. I think this is the face of globalization. So if you have sleeping giants that wake up and they decide they want to go to work and, and develop, they're extremely impoverished. And they want to do it by linking to the US or to the Euro, open their borders, invite the world's business community to come over there, build factories, employ their people, bring the goods back to the US. Um, anybody who's on the front lines of that story is going to benefit. Well, I think this is what you're looking at. Uh, this is the story of globalization. And the way I think about it is um, I didn't, I'm pretty sure that the Chinese worker that worked on this tie didn't get 60 bucks. Uh, somebody else did. And I think that's part of what's going on in this picture. So to me, to me it creates a lot of stress. And, and I'll mention briefly about that. But I think. Well, when you see a picture like this, it's just really hard for me. It, it's the smell of opportunity, because what you're seeing is we're back, businesses are healthy, and meanwhile, around us, something big is going on. And I think this is why you see it in the equity market. The equity market, top line is the US market. The other line is everybody else. Um, it's the ratio of where the stock market is relative to where we were at the last peak. We fully recovered. Obviously, the market, which is supposed to be smelling opportunity, Will, will react when you see stories unfolding like, it, like they have. The job market is going to take longer, but we're getting there. Um, this picture is showing you trends in all different kinds of measures of employment, hours worked, GDP is the solid shaded area. Everything is a ratio to where we were in December of 19, uh, 2007. All I'm trying to give, give you the impression that when you look at what's going on, no matter what you look at of the US economy, it feels like the tide's coming in. And, and, and that's... that's uh, you, you, when you look at that picture, by the way, you can't find the places where we worried about Europe or the places we worried about the fiscal cliff. Um, probably more encouraging to me than anything that I've seen so far is California. California, which was ground zero of the housing debacle. Uh, even in California, the yellow line, employment is coming back. And, and by the way, this is a picture you see all across the country. Um, everybody is doing the same thing. The, the, the tide has turned, employment is picking up. Some are slower than others. It's not surprising that California, we've only recovered 43% of the jobs that were lost during the recession. Nationwide, we've recovered about 63% of the jobs that have been lost. There's, there's work to do. And in my mind, uh, what it takes to get back to full employment, we're kind of in the fourth inning of that process. So we've got a ways to go before the job market comes back. That's always the way it is. But as you can tell from the equity market and from what's going on with the profit picture, that um, the markets, the places where we see the first signs of recovery, it's really quite apparent right now. Um, just give you an example of the kinds of things that are in motion when people say, well, it's been slow, so if you've got a new danger that we've got to deal with in the next 10 days, uh, there's a possibility that it will just continue to be slow. The thing to remember is there's a lot in motion here. There's a lot of, there's a lot of cross currents. And one of the biggies is what's going on in the housing market. Housing, this is the first recovery we've had where we'd never had a recovery in the housing market. Uh, and it's for obvious reasons. We overbuilt. 
But when you overbuild, the only way to clean up the mess is by underbuilding. That's what's been going on. That's why the housing industry has been such a drag on the economy. Normally, we get about a half a point to a full point of growth from the housing industry in a normal recovery because this was the housing industry was so there was such a debacle here, so many so many excesses. Um, it was it was a problem. Now that's changing, and as you can tell, because we've cleared the mess, because the prices are back to normal, because young people are beginning to find jobs. Things have changed for the housing market. So as I look into 2013, this is an example of the kinds of things that are in motion that are that are going to be um, that, that are going to be helping us. Now let me let me just uh, on the Fed, another big plus. The Fed is doing um, the Fed is doing a lot to to try to drive investors into risk, uh, to drive to take us to encourage us to take in, in, to take on risk. Um, they're not doing though. What they're doing is not what a lot of people think. When they buy assets, create reserves. Ordinarily, a lot of people worry, well, doesn't that create inflation? Well, it creates inflation if those reserves get loaned out. The picture's telling you something weird is going on. This has nothing to do with what we all learned. When the Fed buys assets, creates reserves, the reserves remain as excess reserves. They're in quarantine. And that's why the monetary base, the black line here, has exploded by the amount that the Fed has been buying assets. But the money supply doing nothing. So this is not treason, what the Fed is doing. Um, the way, the, way to think, the way to think about what the Fed's doing is they are trying to drive long-term rates down. They're trying to drive long rates down because they can't push the funds rate below zero. So what they do is they buy assets. The, what we should know, though, that what the Fed is doing here, that this is uh, totally unusual. It's, it's distorting long-term interest rates. The way you see that is the, this picture is showing you nominal 10-year yields. The blue, the blue area is the thing to focus on. This is the real rate of interest. The, the Fed's action, and this is the rate of interest the market expects five years from now for the next five years, they've driven rates to zero. This is, we're, we're supposed to know that this is, an, this is unusual, it's artificial, it's not going to last forever. Uh, one implication is that for all of us who have infrastructure projects to be investing, this is, a, this is the time we ought to be doing the, invest, the, doing the financing because we're probably not going to see rates like this for, uh, forever. Um, but this is really what the Fed's footprint is. Uh, what they're doing to the market. Um, now, I, I just want to just mention briefly, um, uh, the big issue that we're all wrestling with is the distribution of income is growing. This is not a healthy thing when you have a country that's polarizing economically. And I think, but, but I think we're, we need to think creatively about this. Um, this picture shows you something weird. It kind of gives you a hint of how to think about this. I'm showing you labor productivity, the black line, and real hourly pay. What you'll notice is, you know, we're, we're taught in school that people are paid the value of their marginal product. So what you tend to see is the real wages tend to track along with productivity, and they did for a very long time. Something began to change in the mid-1980s, and we're seeing an extreme di divergence in pay that workers get versus productivity, and it's correlated with measures of the distribution of income. Um, and I think it's, it's the, the flip side of that is it's related to what's going on in profits. And I think the way to think about this is, you know, our, our tendency is to think, well, as, as the economic report the president did a couple of years ago, we don't have, there's nothing wrong with high, you know, people making in, you know, high incomes doing well as long as they're not doing it, getting it at the expense of the lower incomes. Well, the, the way we've got to think about this is this is really not about, this is not a problem that we can address by, trying, by punishing people or by taxing one side and trying to redistribute. You can't, fix that, you can't fix this problem that way. We have to ask ourselves, what's causing the problem? What's, what's the creative way to do this? And I think it's pretty clear. It's all about globalization. It's about the world around us, people wanting to go to work. There's an awful lot of folks we're competing with. That, to me, is what explains why it is that the balance of power has changed. And I think what we need to recognize is the best way to manage this is not to try to shut the world out, but to try to help people who don't have the skills in the education and figure out how to raise, how to, how to uh, lift them up to compete with what's going on globally. One final comment. Um, I think I need to give you an antidote for the death spiral that my friend is going to be taking you on in a few minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so the deficit. So here, I think something, I'm an, I'm an outsider traveling from 40,000 feet. So my, in my mind, there's another way to think about what's going on. When people think about, you know, it's common to think the problem, we, we look at the problem that we can see and we think that's the problem. 
as an economist, my, my opinion is what you see is not the problem. What you see, the actual deficit, is a result of the economy stumbling. That's what the black line is showing you. The actual deficit is a percent of GDP. CBO's forecast for the structural deficit is the shaded area. The reason they are forecasting that in the next 10 years the deficit is going to come down is because we economists all know that when the economy stumbles, the deficit goes up. When the economy gets back on its feet, it's going to come down. The real issue is what you don't see. It's, it's what is in the background driving what, what will turn into a very big structural deficit if we don't do anything about it. We all know what the problem is, the black line. Federal spending for health care was 1% of GDP in 1970. It's 5.5% today. CBO says it's going to be 20% or so in the next several decades. That's the elephant in the room. And this is why, this by the way is why I never went into healthcare economics because I knew this would be a challenging, in my lifetime was going to be challenging to deal with. I think the, I think the, uh, the, the, thing, the thing to remember though is I always told myself, this is a CBO forecast for different categories of spending. Social Security on the bottom, healthcare in the middle, that's the issue. If you assume that the, the American electorate does not want to take on a higher tax burden and revenues stay about 18%, it tells you the spending is the size of the government's going to double. That would turn into a structural deficit. The way I think about this, though, is I always told myself, like um, that, really, when you have a problem like this, that a program that is uh, unsustainable, the you can't expect that we're going to get anywhere close to solving the problem until people in the political world acknowledge it. And I really think something big has been happening in the last year. I think the fact that a politician actually stood up and said, we need to rethink our entitlement system, is the reason why the conversation today that you hear coming out of Washington, every time you hear a discussion about what they're going to do, the fact every time they mention entitlements or Medicare, that's a huge step forward to me. That, that tells you that we at least started to recognize this. So when I go to the first congressional district in Wisconsin, I always tell them, you've got a special place in my book because this is where somebody actually, in my, in my world, it was the first politician I'd ever heard who was, had the courage to stand up and say, we need to think about this. And by the way, this is the reason why I'm bullish on this conference. Thank you.